In the seedy underbelly of our digital age, Jordan Peterson steps into the spotlight, revealing a chilling truth that has ensnared the hearts and minds of countless individuals, the insidious grip of porn addiction. You know, because it's super satiation. And, and, it's, a, and it's, it's a non-trivial technological problem, you know. It's now possible for a young men to look at more beautiful nude women in one day than any man has ever seen, you know, prior to 10 years ago, 20 years ago, than any man in history had ever seen. That's not yeah. nothing. That's something. And to think that doesn't do anything to you, it's like, no, that, that's, that likely does something to you. With a voice laden with urgency and compassion, Peter shines a, or sorry, Peterson, <laughs> my boy Peter, you know, shines a piercing light on the dark corners of this modern affliction, exposing the devastating consequences that ripple through relationships, self-esteem, and society at large. I was reading this book called a Billion Wicked Thoughts that was written by a bunch of engineers at Google and they were looking at billions of search, uh, billions of Google searches and you know there's no shortage of pornography on the internet and, it, and there's much less by proportion than there was when the internet was first invented and it's so interesting because it actually turned out that one of the things that drove the development of the internet and the technology was the proclivity of young men to search out sexually provocative images. That was what was at the forefront of the development of the net. It's extraordinarily interesting. They were motivated to, they were motivated to use it for that purpose and that provided the platform from which it emerged. Amazing. Well, yeah, that's the question, isn't it? You know, if you're masturbating to pornography and the consequence of that is an immediate influx of guilt, then you have to ask yourself who's in control. And that's a really important question, who's in control. You know, that's what terrified me about developing some psychoanalytic acumen, because once you realize that you're a house that many spirits can and do inhabit, and that many of them aren't you, and that many of them aren't working towards the purposes you might want yourself to be working to, and you know, that's the realization of the myth that you're embodying from the Jungian perspective. It's a very, very serious question. The fundamental human myth is Cain versus Abel. And so who are you? Are you Cain or Abel? Well, the answer is you're both. And then the question is, well, who's got the upper hand? And then the next question is, who do you want to have the upper hand? Is it God and Abel or Satan and Cain? And that's a question that's just as germane to non-believers as it is to believers. And isn't that remarkable and appalling and overwhelming and terrifying all at the same time, if you have any sense of what it means? So if your behavior is embarrassing you, well, there's only two possibilities, isn't there? You shouldn't be so embarrassed. And I suppose the voice that says, yes to all expression of human sexuality would say that your guilt and shame is merely the detrimental hangover of an oppressive patriarchy that's judgmental in its attitudes towards sexuality. Well, yeah, well, what would you use judgment to differentiate if it isn't sexuality? So I don't think that argument goes anywhere. I think it, it's like Treasure Island in, in Pinocchio. It's all pleasure with no responsibility that's deadening it's 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 parasitical in a sense and i don't mean that i'm not making a value judgment i mean it's no wonder the young guys are caught up in this because it's an unbelievably powerful technology it it drove the development of the internet let's not forget yeah. right so it taps into one viciously primordial motivation and so these guys are being blasted by what biologists call super stimuli all the time so imagine that there's a biological stimulus that has an effect on you and then you can magnify it. And the, the typical porn actress, not the amateurs, but the professionals, have their sexually provocative physical elements exaggerated. Mm -hmm. And so men are very visual in terms of their sexual processing. Um, and so, you know, the, the guys are pulled into it and they're pulled into it also by curiosity. But I think that ethically it's a, it's a, it's, it's not good. It's not good. It's, it's an easy out. That's the other thing, you know, yeah. is what you should be doing is going out and finding someone to have a relationship with. And if you can gratify yourself with no transformation, but let's say you can't find someone. 
Well, then you might say that's an indication you should change. Mm -hmm. It is, in fact, an indication that you should change because Google engineers looked at pornographic search processes and then segregated male searches from female searches and what they found was that the male searched out images surprise surprise no one no one considers that you know particularly interesting but the female searched out literary representations of pornography it was written and so I can give you an example of that if you know about Harlequin romances does everybody still know about those anybody not know about those okay well they're mass market romances and of, of a very stereotypical type and uh, they're, the original ones were pretty harmless in, in terms of no violence and no real sexual contact, con content. But that was 40 years ago and they've differentiated tremendously and now there's hardcore Harlequin romances and with, with particularly garish covers and then there's the old, you know, more tame, basic, sexless and aggressionless romances where everything is implied and not explicit, but the explicit ones exist. So they did a plot analysis of the typical pornographic female fantasy. Well, and it was so, it's so comical because engineers did this and social scientists would never do this because they'd be probably too concerned about the ethics of it or some damn thing. But engineers, you know, they'll just plow ahead with no concern whatsoever for such things. And they actually discover things that way. And so they, they discovered the basic plot of the female pornographic literary product. And they identified, so basically what happened was that a innocent, well-meaning and attractive young woman encounters a male who's a bit of a monster. And the monster, there's five types of classic male monster. For all you males who want to know, this is what you can become. Vampire, that's a good one. Werewolf, billionaire, pirate and surgeon. Okay, so that's very interesting because well, first of all, there's a dominance thing. There's a, now you're actually blushing, you know, you're actually blushing about that. That's very, very funny. So, <laughs> sorry to point it out, but it's so comical, you know. I know, I know, it's so funny. I, I, I was reading this, I was reading this. It was just cracking me up. I thought, oh my God, really? Pirate, vampire, oh, that explains it. What about all these damn vampire shows, right? They're so popular online. They're so popular on Netflix. Oh yes, and then there's the werewolf. There's nothing sexier than a werewolf, apparently. But I mean, so there's predatory, do there's predatory dominance that's implicit in that, right? With the billionaire, it's more abstract, but clearly that's an indication of very high success in the male dominance hierarchy. So, but there's this desire for aggression that's in that, a real aggression. Right, and it's not surprising to me to me at all. It makes perfect sense. Um, but what? But the basic plot is that the woman encounters this mysterious and aggressive male and tames him. That's the female hero myth, as far as I can tell. It's Beauty and the Beast, and so it's because well, there's no fun in taming someone who's already tame. And what makes you think you really want someone who's tame anyways? There's no interest in that. Plus, when, when, when chaos manifests itself, what makes you think that someone tame is gonna be good for anything? And it's a real question. And so that aggression is absolutely vital. It's absolutely necessary. But because it's inc incredibly dangerous, which of course it is, it has to be civilized. And so what happens is that the archetypal female in these pornographic romances seduces and tames the aggressive male. And that's her encounter with chaos. Now it's more, it's more comp of course females, they're more complicated and that's exactly how it is. And it's no wonder because their, their lives are more complicated. You have to consult your own conscience. Like I know the conscience can become an oppressive force on its own. That's the indwelling of the great tyrant, you know, and Freud made much of that, a, a too oppressive superego. And I've certainly seen clients whose expression of healthy sexuality was inhibited by a too rigid superego. That can definitely happen. But that doesn't mean that all guilt about all forms of sexual expression constitutes a superego run amok. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that there was some relationship between the sexual revolution of the 1960s, which according to Randy Thornhill, by the way, who's perhaps the world's top biology, biological thinker on this particular topic, Thornhill believed that the liberalism of the 60s was a consequence, at least in part, 
and in large part, I should say, of the hygienic revolution of the previous six decades and more that enabled us to reduce the impact, at least in the West, of infectious diseases. And because we were much less prone to the transmission and receipt of infectious diseases, we could afford to be more liberal by the 1960s. So we got more sexually liberal. And what happened? AIDS. And I say that without prejudice. And what's the most effective means of facilitating the reproduction of a deadly virulent agent and its propagation through the population? Unrestrained sexual behavior. And so that would be a multitude of partners. So sexual shame is there for a reason and it's not a trivial reason and it's not just going to go away because we may wave the magic wand and make the patriarchal oppressor vanish and that's not going to happen either by the way and psychopaths you know they have no conscience they lie all the time well how do they get away with it they don't they have to move because people figure out who they are and then they have to move on and so you could say well that's getting away with it it's like well no no, no long-term relationships, no love, no trust, no, no, no brotherly affection, no friends, you know, and generally no financial success, not in the real sense. So how is that getting away with it? And then you might say, well, I've got away with it so far. It's like, maybe you have, and maybe you're just too dim to see the consequences because you've blinded yourself and God only knows who you could have been if you wouldn't have lied your way to where you are now. No, it's, I, I, I've never seen it. And you know, sometimes I'd go work with someone to untangle what had happened to them over multiple years as things fell apart. And we'd find all sorts of lies, not always ones they told, but sometimes lies their parents told them, for example, that deep, dark, terrible things, you know, messing things up in an unbelievably catastrophic and tragic way. Now it was absolutely terrifying. But I can't see how it just doesn't make sense. It's like, how could you possibly defend the idea that you could warp the structure of reality and get away with it? I mean, who, who, like I said, who do you think you are? Reality is, you don't mess with it. Like, it kills you. And it'll torture you quite a lot before doing that if you're not, if you're un particularly unlucky. So beware. You know, they say the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. That's that judgmental God. It's you violate your conscience, man. You will pay. That's hell. If you're ashamed about your sexual behavior, then you have to ask yourself, is the shame wrong or is the sexual behavior wrong? And I'm asking you, I'm not judging your behavior because what the hell do I know about you? And I have enough trouble with my own behavior. So, you know, this is on you. Is your shame what you should be dispensing with or the behavior. And you know, it might be a little of column A and a little of column B because life is never simple. But if you don't feel ennobled by your porn related masturbation, then perhaps that means it's of questionable utility. I certainly don't see it as a stabilizing social force. I don't see it as something people do in public and, and brag about. And, and I know that sexual behavior is private and should remain that way, but you, you get what I'm driving at. So, look, I think people shouldn't lie, especially to themselves. And I think repeatedly engaging in a behavior that you judge yourself to be morally reprehensible is a form of performative contradiction, which is the acting out of a lie. And I suspect you know that or you wouldn't be asking the question. And so, you know, what should you do with pornography? Well, you know the answer to that, and so does everybody else. Everyone knows it's not good. It's not good for those who produce it. It's not good for those who participate wittingly or unwittingly, because there's plenty of them in its production. It's not good for its consumers. Or certainly not the highest good. And what's the highest good? Sexuality incorporated within uh, functional intimate relationship bound by vows of mutual celibacy. 
And we all know that too. That stabilizes our families. It stabilizes our societies. It stabilizes our psyches. And so anything you do that isn't in service of that goal is likely to be counterproductive. And I suspect it's your own psyche, your own soul telling you that. So if your sexuality, if your sexual behavior isn't an expression of your highest being, then it, it isn't serving you in the deepest sense. You're serving it. And that's what your shame indicates. So get out there and find a partner and commit to her or him. In the vast landscapes of personal growth and societal transformation, Jordan Peterson emerges as a prophet of responsibility, imploring us to embrace the weighty burden of accountability that lies at the heart of a meaningful existence. With an unwavering conviction, Peterson unearths the profound truth that the path to self-actualization and societal harmony begins with the resolute commitment to take ownership of our actions.
If you're dating a narcissist or in a relationship with a narcissist, they'll alienate all your family members and your mm. friends so that they get all the attention. And that'll just be the first of the games they play with you. Yeah. Then you have psychopathy. And the psychopaths are parasitical predators. And so the predator will take whatever you've got and the parasite will live off you. Now, you've got these two evil creatures here, the fox and the cat. Um, I think this one's based on one of the Marx brothers, actually, Harpo Marx, who I believe never said anything. But be that as it may, there are these ne'er-do-well characters, um, the fox in particular. Now, fox is a standard trickster animal, right? It's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a classic animal, maybe because it's, it, it's good at hiding and it's good at hunting. I don't know exactly why, but it's, it, and coyotes are like that too. They're classic trickster animals. Um, he's kind of like Wiley Coyote, in fact, you know, the, the, the Warner Brothers character who's genius at large and, of course, whose arrogance continually gets him walloped. And this character has a lot of features like that, but he, he's, he feigns being a, an English gentleman of like the 1890s and pretends to be educated and, and uh, he has a kind of high-blown way of talking, and he's a fraud through and through. And he's got, he's got this, you know, sidekick who is barely there at all. And he, he doesn't treat him that well, but, but he's got someone to lord it over. So that keeps his dominance hierarchy thing going well. And the fact that he's like a second-rate companion, well, he never really notices that. Although he'll treat him contemptuously whenever he gets a chance. So anyways, they're walking down the street, and... Uh, the uh, fox is bragging away about some crooked thing that he's done and how he pulled the wool over someone's eyes. And he confuses that with uh, wisdom and intelligence. And one of the things that you see, this is worth knowing too, because if you're preyed upon by a psychopath, which you will be to some degree at some point in your life, the psychopath who will be narcissistic will presume that you're stupid and, and, and that you deserve to be taken advantage of because you're naive and stupid. So it's actually a good thing that he's doing it. And uh, he, his proof for, and I'm saying he because there are more male psychopaths, um, the, uh, the proof that you're stupid naive is that he can take advantage of you. And so, like, if you were wiser, you'd, you'd be, you know, you'd, you'd know his tricks and then it wouldn't be morally necessary for him to show you just exactly who knows what about what. So the blue fairy shows up, so that's nature. So what I'm saying is that nature will cut kids a break. If you think of nature in the guise of, well, their mother, for example, but even the biology of other people, because we're wired to accept behavior from children that we wouldn't accept from other people. So nature will forgive. So she shows up in her heavenly guise and says, what's going on? And Pinocchio, again, because he's naive, but also because he's not good. He's not evil either. He's, he's neither or both. It depends on how you look at it. And he also has no idea how smart he is and how smart he isn't or how smart the person he's talking to is. And uh, instead of admitting what he's done, he lies about it. And that's interesting because it does suggest that he understands at some level that he set himself up for this. Because, you know, he could just say, he could have just told the truth. This horrible fox kidnapped me and, and sold me to this, this slaveholder, which is true. It's a lot more true than the story he tells. He tells a story about some monster, you know, a fictional monster. He could have told even three quarters of the truth and had it work, but he doesn't. He just obscures the story entirely. And this is the part of the movie that people remember. Um, and I'd edited this out for years when I was talking about this movie. I, I, I forgot why it was so significant. His nose grows. Right, and it, it grows to ridiculous length. And why is that? I think it was Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, I think, who said, one of the advantages to telling the truth is that you don't have to remember what you said. And that, God, that's worth listening to because... So uh, there's a bunch of things I've learned as a clinician. And one of them is, because you're often in really weird situations with people if you're a clinician, because things happen that don't happen normally, and you don't know what to do. And so what I've learned is I just say, what, I just say what's happening, whatever it is, regardless of what it is. You know, I'll just try to describe it as accurately as I can, and not worry about 
in some sense not worry about the consequences you know like I'm not going out of my way to cause trouble but if you're in a really and I'm telling you this can save your life at times especially if you're dealing with someone who's paranoid who's really paranoid you do not lie to someone who's paranoid and violent because as soon as you lie you're aligned with the forces that are persecuting them and they're going to be what because paranoia makes people hyper vigilant like they're on amphetamines in fact you can make pe people paranoid by giving them enough amphetamines and you can make paranoid people more paranoid by giving them amphetamines so they're hyper vigilant because they feel that everything is predatory and against them and so they're watching you like you would not believe way more than you're watching them and if you flicker a lie while you're talking to them and they're really on the edge you you're done this is the Peter Pan story roughly speaking is Peter Pan is this magical boy Pan means, Pan is the god of everything, roughly speaking, right? And so it's not an accident that he has the name Pan. And he's the boy that won't grow up. And he's magical. Well, that's because children are magical. They can be anything. They're nothing but potential. And Peter Pan doesn't want to give that up. Why? Well, he's got some adults around him, but the main adult is Captain Hook. Well, who the hell wants to grow up to be Captain Hook? First of all, you've got a hook. Second, you're a tyrant. And third, you're chased by the dragon of chaos with a clock in its stomach. Right? The crocodile. It's already got a piece of you. Well, that's what happens when you get older. Time has already got a piece of you. And eventually, it's got a taste for you. And eventually, it's going to eat you. And so, Hook is so traumatized by that that he can't help but be a tyrant. And then Peter Pan looks at traumatized Hook and says, Well, no, I'm not sacrificing my childhood for that. So that's fine, except he ends up king of the Lost Boys. In Neverland, well, Neverland doesn't exist, and who the hell wants to be king of the Lost Boys? And he also sacrifices the possibility that he'll have a real relationship with a woman, because that's Wendy, right? And she's kind of conservative, middle-class, London-dwelling girl. She wants to grow up and have kids and have a life. She accepts her mortality, she accepts her maturity. Peter Pan has to content himself with Tinkerbell. She doesn't even exist. She's like, she's like the fairy of porn. She doesn't exist. She's the substitute for the real thing. And so, but the dichotomy that you're talking about is very tricky because there's a sacrificial element in maturation, right? You have to sacrifice the pluripotentiality of childhood for the actuality of a frame. And the question is, well, why would you do that? Well, one reason is, it happens to you whether you do it or not. You can either choose your damn limitation, or you can let it take you unaware when you're 30, or even worse, when you're 40. And then, that is not a happy day. And you see, I see people like this, and I think it's more and more common in our culture, because people can put off mat maturity without suffering an immediate penalty. But all that happens is the penalty accrues and then when it finally hits, it just wallops you, because when you're 25, you can be an idiot. It's no problem. Even when you're out in a job search, it's like, well, you don't have any experience and you're kind of clueless. It's, yeah, yeah, you're young, you know, it's no problem. We can, that's what young people are like, but they're full of potential. Okay, well, now you're the same person at 30. It's like, people aren't so thrilled about you at that point. It's like, what the hell have you been doing for the last 10 years? Well, I'm just as clueless as I was when I was 22. It's, yeah, but you're not 22. You're an old infant, right? And that's an ugly thing, an old infant. And then, here's a parasitical ideological statement. Property is theft. A classic Marxist trope. Why would you say that? Well, if I want to live off you, the way I'm going to justify that ethically is by claiming, well, you know, Joe, look how privileged you are. You've got all this money. You just, you just took that from the oppressed. And if I'm manipulating you so that I get some of your money, that's only just because, first of all, it's exactly what you did. And second of all, well, why not spread some of that wealth around? So that's Machiavellianism, narcissism, and psychopathy, dark triad. They've expanded that recently to add another dimension that was missing, sadism. And the sadist takes positive delight in causing pain to others. And the lulls culture, L-U-L-Z, the lulls culture online is a culture of sadistic, Machiavellian, narcissistic, psychopaths. Oh, he's lying, and I'm not. So that's a big part of the, that's a big part of the issue. I don't believe that he ever says a word that's true. 
from what I've been able to observe. It's all stage acting. He's crafted a persona. He has a particular instrumental goal in mind and everything is subordinated to serve that. And Why? So, What's the motivation? Uh, the same motivation that generally, that's generally typical of people who are narcissistic, which is to uh, be accredited with moral virtue in the absence of the work necessary to actually attain it. All right. From, He's playing a role. From you know the swastika yeah. thing. It's like really it's just about Canadians. Really, we're going to be worried about Nazis in Canada because I had protests, for example, where people accused me of attracting Nazis. First of all, that just isn't a thing in Canada. There isn't a Nazi tradition. And I don't know anyone in Canada who's ever met anyone who's met someone who was Canadian who, and who was a Nazi. And so that's just a non-starter. And so when that sort of thing gets dragged into the conversation, right off the bat, you know, the Canadians shouldn't be subjected to the inherent violence of a swastika. First of all, it's not even obvious what that swastika was doing there. There's, a, there's reasonable evidence to suggest that the person who was waving it was either a plant or someone who was making the comment that that was what was characteristic of the government, not of what they believed. Now, no one knows because the story around that event is messy and uh, it's not like there were credible journalists who were going in there to investigate thoroughly. But to use that uh, and the Confederate the Confederate flag issue is exactly the same thing. It's, it's one thing to really know if you're ever in a really bad situation and you don't know what to do. You tell the truth minimally. You don't disclose too much. That's just another lie. You tell the truth minimally and carefully and hopefully. And you might get out of it. You might get out of it. But if you falsify it, look the hell out. So. The truth is a real is a real mechanism of protection in dangerous situations. You know, so if someone's trying to intimidate you and you, you think they might get violent and they ask you if you're afraid, then you tell them that you're terrified and that you hope that things will go okay. Or you say, I'll give you an example. One time I was in an airport and uh, we were in this lineup to fly back to Canada that said international flights and so it was a long lineup like 50 people and we got a, I got about three from the front and there were still like 40 people behind me and the guy behind the counter decided that he was just going to shut down the line and that we could all go to this other line which was like 300 people long and I suggested that he not do that because we'd been standing there for half an hour and that he could just deal with the 20 of us that were left and and like have a clue and so he called the sheriff right away and this was down in Florida, and it wasn't that long after 9-11. And so these guys came up, and they were armed. And they came and said, looked at me, because of course he told them that I was causing trouble, which I wasn't. I was just trying to not let, what would you say, an arrogant, bureaucratic scum rat take advantage of me. <laughs> so, which is not the same as causing trouble. So anyways, as soon as the cops came up, I said, look, I'm going to do exactly what you tell me to do right now, and I'm not going to cause any trouble. But I would like you to hear what actually happened. And so that, that's a good example of a situation like that. It's like, if someone's got you, no brava, bravado. It's a very bad idea. And I was going to do exactly what they told me, because, you know, they didn't know who I was, and I didn't know what they had been told. So, anyhow. The problem with lying is that it's a hydra, and kids find this out very early, because you tell one lie, and what happens is it has one of the consequences that you expect, maybe you get away with it, but it has three or four others that you don't expect, and so it's like it grows some, some complexity, and then you have to tack a lie on each of those little complexity outcrops, and then they grow three more complexities, and soon this little lie turns into a great big ball of lies, and at some point it becomes painfully evident to everyone. And by that time, you're in such... You see this with politicians, like that guy who was sexting. Um, we, Anthony Weiner, yeah, perfect name for him, man. It's so funny. Uh, I, I shouldn't make that comment because it's so obvious, but it's still funny. But, you know, he... That's exactly what happened to him. It's like, it wasn't even so much the event, because... You know, people are stupid, they make mistakes, and actually, the public is somewhat forgiving if you say, yeah, geez, I'm a real moron, and you know, like, really, 
seriously, how could I do that? But I did, and like, I'll try not to do it again. But what happens with politicians is, and, and I'm not speaking specifically of politicians, is they'll make an error and it gets exposed and then they make three others trying to cover it up. It happened with Nixon, for example, and then the whole thing just turns into a complete scandal.